All right, we are returning back to assignment five, looking at our course outline on October 30th here. We're gonna learn how to add color behind our line art to turn these into full color spot illustrations. And what we want before we can start adding color is to turn our line art into a vector, right? And we're using Adobe Illustrator for that, even though it's not freeware. You could also use vectorizer.ai as a website, but you have to pay like $3 subscription. Or you could use vectormagic.com, which is I think a $200 lifetime license. All of these are tools that turn pixel images into vector images, but they only really work well on just solid black shapes, right? So it's perfect for line art, it's perfect for black shape logos. So what we're gonna do is work on that today so that we can have it finished by the end of today, beginning of next class, and then we'll do our presentation critiques on them next class. And then remember, we're gonna take our full color spot illustrations and we're gonna be adding text to them to make a poster for our next assignment. So you don't need to add text into your spot illustration. We'll be doing that with the next assignment. And our theme overall for this is vote, V-O-T-E. So I am taking, for this afternoon class, a more pessimistic view. But for the morning class, let me show you what these things look like. And since in the morning class I'm doing Adobe Photoshop, let me just show you Ultimately, the advantage of being in the afternoon is you get to kind of see the big picture. So what we do is we take your vector line art and we bring it into a raster program like Photoshop. We're going to use Photo P. And we bring it in, I did this at the end of last class, by opening a new file that is large, 11 by 14 inches by 350 pixels per inch, right? And it's going to just open with a white background. Then we drag and drop our SVG vector file on into PhotoP. This is Photoshop, so I used my EPS vector file. What this is, is what I call the digital coloring sandwich. So you have black line art on top. Think of it as black bread. And on the very bottom, you have a blank white background. Think of that as white bread. We padlock both of those because a really common mistake is to accidentally rasterize your vector line art. You don't want to do that. And then we make a sandwich. And two pieces of bread alone do not make a sandwich. You need stuff in between the bread. So the most basic sandwich is a cheese sandwich, right? So a cheese sandwich, I have it in yellow here, is you just put flat color underneath your line art. So if I turn off the black bread, this is what it looks like. And remember, it's floating in between the white bread and the black bread. So it's just solid shapes of color, like panes of colored glass that go underneath your black vector line art. Now, this is a technique of flat color called flatting. This is the professional technique. They are supposed to look crazy. Because the whole point of flatting is that you fill everything with a different color so that they're easy to change later. Flatting is an entry-level digital artist job. It's always in demand. It pays from thirty to forty thousand dollars a year, and you are just filling up line art <laughs> with flat, really diverse colors. That then a better-paid digital artist will actually choose the correct colors <laughs> and put them in. But they do it on top of your flatting file because that makes it easy to drop in the colors. That's always the first step. That's the most simple form of digital coloring. It's called flat color. The difference between flatting is these colors are arbitrary and kind of chaotic, whereas your flat local color, those are the colors that the thing actually is. You know, the skin color, the color of the check mark, the color of the cloud. You choose what the local color is. So if it was a banana, flatting color might be pink, but your local flat color would be yellow because that's the color you want the banana to be. Once you've done flat color, then you can play with refining those flat colors, really dialing them in to get the exact flat you want, which is a lot harder than it seems. And this is where it's really helpful to have reference images. So I have some from my Rutabaga comic, right? So some of these colors I was able to use 
because I like that palette. And so those became my permanent flat colors. Now flat color can work as a finished digital coloring technique. But in order for it to work, it needs to work not just on a white background, but also on a gray background, also on a black background. And if it can work on all three, then it's going to work on any colored background, which is good for a sticker or a t-shirt design or a tattoo, right, on different skin tones. So let's look at the other types of color. Once you have your flat color, which is your basic cheese sandwich, then you can decide to put some condiments on it, right? If you want a slightly darker flavor, you could put like a stone ground mustard. And this is what's called duotone. So duotone is when you split your flat color into lights and darks. So you can see that the shadows here are all crisply cut out. And so this is a form of duotone called cut edge or hard edge duotone. In animation, this is called cell shading from the old way that you would paint physically on the back of the cells. The ink work would be printed onto plastic transparencies on one side, and then the, the painting would go with basically a, a opaque acrylic on the back side. Now, you can also play with duotone where you soften the edge. And soft edge duotone is this soft gradient between the lights and darks. So we have soft edged here, we have hard edged here. See the difference? But both of them are duotone because they're taking the local flat color and just splitting it into lights and darks. They are not changing the color, they're just making lighter and darker versions of the color. Okay, the next effect comes with full spectrum. <laughs> and full spectrum is when you start using any colors you want anywhere you want in the image. So this is where some color theory might come into play. The full spectrum I used was, if I put it at 100% here, is here. Is using cool shadows like turquoise and purple shadows and sinking those in on top of the the duotone color so that color now mixes with my duotone shadows and makes it just a little bit more complex and interesting and then i like to do this effect which is making a, a merged copy of all the color and then setting it to dissolve mode and then taking the opacity down a little bit to get this kind of paper texture in the flat color. Just because I get a little annoyed when everything's just so perfectly smooth in digital coloring. So I like in the coloring for it to have a little bit of that texture. And so this was my finished example for the morning class. And you want the colors to look good on black, to look good on gray, and to look good on white. And then you turn off all your backgrounds, you save it as a PNG, you put it up to canvas, and that's one of your three requirements, right? Sketch, clean black line art, and then a full color spot illustration. All right. So we're not using Photoshop, but we are using the vector line art that we created. And ours... is a less optimistic interpretation of this theme with the uh, the curb curb stomped donut and the cigarette ash and the flies floating around so to start it up just to remind you i need for this class to have vector formats and there are three vector formats that you want they're up on the whiteboard here because it's new to remind you. So once you have a vector in Adobe Illustrator, you want to save it as an AI file. That's an Adobe Illustrator file. I'll open that up in Illustrator so you can see it. Then you also want to save it as an EPS. That's for Adobe products like Photoshop. And then you also want to save it as an SVG. So this is my vector. This is an Illustrator. You can see all of the different anchor points. Right, making it up. And it can be adjusted just like any vector. 
and it's perfectly clean at any size. But we need to save those out in those three formats to your computer. An AI, an SVG, and an EPS. Now because we're using freeware, we're going to use the SVG vector file. And we're going to bring that into a photo P file. But what we do not do is this. We do not right click and open the SVG directly. We do not do this, because you'll see what happens. If I open up Photo P, which is where we'll do our coloring behind the vector line art, we don't open up the SVG like this, because then it will look like that, where every path has its own layer. And it's complicated as anything. So what do we do to simplify this problem? What we do is we say, Photo P, new project. We call it our name, assignment five, full color, spot, illustration. And then because we want this to work with a poster design that we do in the next project along with type design, we're going to make it 350 pixels per inch, our studio resolution for printing. And then we're going to put it in inches and our physical dimensions are going to be bigger than our usual 8 by 10. We're going to make it 11 by 14. Because my spot illustration is wider than it is tall, I'm going to make mine 14 inches by 11 inches. If you do 11 by 14 at 350, that allows you to print at the largest size that our lab can support, which is good for posters. So now I have this file, which is called Carl Assignment 5 Full Color Spot Illustration. It's a PSD file. If I check my image size, which is always good to do, it is in inches, 14 inches by 11 inches by 350 pixels per inch. So this is big enough. This is good. Now I drag and drop my SVG vector. Remember SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphic. I drag and drop it in and it will come in as a single layer, but that layer is like a custom vector shape. It is a smart object and you want to leave it as a smart object. So immediately, I can resize it if I want to, but I might as well leave it pretty big because it will match whatever resolution I give it because it's a vector file. And then I am going to lock it. I'm going to use the padlock. This is my black bread on top. And then the background layer, I'm going to double click and I'm going to rename it blank white. And I'll call it bread, just so you remember that metaphor. And then I'm going to double click it. And I'm going to lock it. So both of these are locked, which means I cannot accidentally paint on them. <laughs> you don't ever want to paint on your blank white layer at the bottom, your white bread, or your line art. Because you never want to rasterize your vector line art. So what do I need to make a sandwich? I need at least one thing in between the bread. So I'm going to make a new layer. I'm going to call this cheese and I'm going to mark it with a yellow color. Okay, now, because I like grilled cheese, grilled cheese is good. So how can I color behind my illustration? Well, I don't want you to overthink it too much. I'm going to be teaching you what I think are the right techniques. But as long as you have the layers set up the right way, you could just use your brush tool. You could use your color selector here, your foreground color selector. And I could say, you know, I want my cigarette. I know what the colors of a cigarette are, the local colors. There's like a brown filter. And I could just start choosing my brush. I'm going to use a hard edge brush at 100% opacity. And I could just start filling it in. You know, not too complicated. But I start by just filling it in with flat color. Now, what do I have? I have just a little little bit of cheese between my bread and you see that it is behind the line art. The problem is because I'm doing it with my paintbrush it kind of can overshoot the lines and it's a little arduous to keep choosing colors this way so for the cigarette part that's not the filter maybe I want a shadow underneath it like this. I want to turn it, my tablet to be pressure sensitive and then I can get more variety of